you know, there's been contro- controversies about A1 Telecom in Belarus uh, shutting down internet access during protests, which has led to uh, charges of it um, violating protesters' freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and so on. So there were demands by NGOs that um, A1 Austria Telecom, which is the parent company of A1 Belarus Telecom, should be held accountable for this. If we go to the next slide, um, there was uh, outcry over the uh, huge Russian mining company, Norilsk Nickel, their uh, spill um, in, in their mines recently, and there were outcries about it being held accountable because this spill was apparently caused by poor construction. So these issues are certainly no stranger to our region. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can see um, why, you know, we'll talk a bit about how we got here. So what is it that, that, that led us to this point where business and human rights are intertwined and that we have this link and this connection made between them. Um, so the, the first thing to bear in mind is that there's been a huge expansion of transnational corporations since World War II. Uh, according to OECD data, there were 7,000 transnational corporations in 1970, whereas in 2014, there were 230,000 corporations. And this is not only in the West or in the global North, as we like to call it at UNDP. Uh, transnational corporations were eventually set up in the BRIC states, in you know Mexico, India, Brazil, China, others, uh, Russia, and so on. So there's a, a vast range of transnational corporations active right now, and their impacts are being keenly felt all over the world. And eventually, this started to obviously be noticed, you know, with a series of, let's say, landmark moments in business and human rights. Uh, we've noted some here. There's obviously a huge list to pick from. One of these, uh, and this is the picture on the top, is the case of Chevron or formerly Texaco, which was, uh, which basically between 1964 and 1992, unleashed what was called by some a toxic Chernobyl. It left over 600 unlined oil pits in the Amazon. It dumped over 68 billion liters of toxic production water into rivers. You can see how, you know, what impact that had. And eventually uh, communities, local communities sued in court in the US and Ecuador, in Canada eventually to enforce the judgment. They won nine and a half billion dollars in damages. So this case drags on, but Chevron has not yet paid up. Uh, so this, the impacts of this are being keenly felt to this day. Chevron bought Texaco in 2001, acquired Texaco, but it hasn't been able to shake the, the consequences of Texaco's actions in Ecuador in, in, in the second half of the 20th century. Another example that we noted here is the notorious killings of Coca-Cola union leaders in Colombia where eight union leaders were in Coca-Cola bottling plants were killed between 1989 and 2002. After protesting the company's labor practices, Coca-Cola was accused of colluding with paramilitary groups who um, were then allegedly the ones behind the killings. Uh, this case also went to court in, in the United States and has also harmed Coca-Cola's reputation tremendously, just with, witnessed the Killer Coke website. Um, and then third, um, you know, a third case noted here is the Bhopal disaster in uh, Bhopal disaster in India. That's the bottom picture here. Uh, this is one that many of you are probably familiar with, where a chemical leak from a Union Carbide pesticide plant ended up gassing thousands of people to death. Uh, and the consequences there are still felt to this day. Dow Chemical, which is the parent company of Union Carbide, has not acknowledged liability. And this case also continues to drag on both in court and politically. Um, so if we go to the next slide, these were important moments, but there were two perhaps watershed moments that you know trend, led the transition to what we have now, the framework that we have now. Uh, one is of the so-called Ogoni 9. Uh, this was a, a very well covered case in the press in the 1990s, where Shell, uh, which had been exploring for oil and extracting oil in Nigeria and the Ogoni region of Nigeria was accused of colluding basically with security forces to have local activists, the so-called Ogoni Nine, um, you know, suppressed and 
the Iranian nine were eventually charged with murder on possibly trumped up charges. They were executed. The most prominent member was Ken Sarawiwa. And this received a huge amount of attention and harmed Shell's standing internationally. It had received a lot of negative press and so on. And the other, uh, let's say, notable case that was possibly a watershed moment was the case of so-called sweatshop labor. This isn't necessarily restricted to one business. Uh, it had to do with a range of brands, but there was a story and this notorious photo of a 12-year-old boy in Pakistan sewing a, a Nike ball in Life magazine, back when magazines used to be important and noted. Uh, this photo attracted a lot of attention and eventually led to the development of codes of conduct, which we'll talk about next. So all of these cases and watershed moments led us to led activists um, and some businesses and NGOs, but you know mostly NGOs, activists, and trade unions to try to develop a, so a governance structure to deal with this issue. You know, how could we prevent these abuses? And if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see what the responses were. There was a whole range of attempted responses, some of which were successful, some of which failed, leading us to where we we are now. The, let's say the first of these that we want to highlight is the UN Code of Conduct for Transnational Corporations. So there was already a UN attempt from 1974 onwards to develop a co coherent response to this. This process dragged on for 19 years. It was eventually abandoned in 1993 without success. But in the meantime, in the 1970s, it, it, let's say just subsequently to that, there were two um, major pieces of... Um, of the governance framework governing this issue, one of which is the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which are still uh, very much uh, enforced to this day. They uh, set up a, a range of standards for corporations to, um, or a, a range of recommendations for corporations to adhere to, and uniquely have national co contact points in 49 countries uh, that corporations can, and sorry, that, that can resolve disputes between businesses and communities through mediation, conciliation, and so on. Another one is the ILO Declaration of Multinational Enterprises. Uh, it relies on international labor standards codified by the International Labor Organization, the ILO, uh, and is also an important piece of the governance framework. Subsequent to that, we had the rise of corporate social responsibility, and we talk a bit about that, and I'm sure our opening speakers will remark upon that, and I think possibly a lot of the participants here think of corporate social responsibility as business and human rights. Um, we like to say that business and human rights is CSR 2.0, uh, the, the key difference being that C corporate social responsibility has to do with do-goodery, philanthropy, charity and the idea that a corporation can do good, whereas as Harpreet and I will outline, business and human rights has to do with the actual responsibilities of the corporation to do no harm and then some positive obligations as well. After that, in the 1990s, we saw the initial codes of conduct developed by trade unions and companies which had policies of their own. Um, and then we had multi-stakeholder initiatives where corporations, trade unions, NGOs got together um, to basically try to set up some sort of framework to tackle these issues. This was followed by the UN Global Compact in 2000, um, where corporations signed up to 10 principles uh, after the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan spoke of the need to tackle this issue and corporations report on these, eventually leading to the UN Guiding Principles and Business and Human Rights, which were unanimously adopted in 2011. And I'll now ask my colleague Harpreet to start talking about those. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks, Tanisha, and good morning, everyone. Um, you know, um, and thanks, Tanisha, you know, for sort of really laying down the business case for investing in business and human rights. But, you know, maybe let's just take a pause and uh, reflect on the current situation. You know, if you look at it, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic not only has magnified existing inequalities in our economic development model that feeds discrimination, marginalization, exploitation of workers and gender based violence but also has brought into stronger focus the crucial role that businesses have in ensuring the respect for human rights. You know, while uh, governments and businesses' responses to the pandemic have been varied in, uh, you know, in all, all across the world, but I think one thing is very, very clear that, you know, uh, putting human rights is at the center of such responses, and that has never been 
uh, as great a priority uh, before. And I think what Shanisha was also, you know, in his last slide was essentially saying that uh, that you know that the UN guiding principles or this or this discourse did not uh, you know did not arise out of a vacuum or you know developed in a vacuum, and that there have been efforts you know from the UN agencies but various other stakeholders, uh, and there have been efforts in place. Uh, there have been efforts in place since decades. So it was in 2005. I cannot see my um, Elizabeth. Can you continue sharing the slide, please? Sure, thanks. Um, thanks. So it was in 2005 that, you know, in an attempt to overcome the diverse debate regarding the human rights responsibilities of business, the Human Rights Commission requested uh, the appointment of the uh, appointment of the Secretary General, uh, appointment of the Secretary General on the issue of human rights and the TNC. It was in July 2005 that Professor John Ruggie was appointed in this position. In 2008, on completion of his, um, you know, in, in he was at that point of time in 2005, Professor Ruggi was appointed to identify and clarify existing standards and practices with regards to business and human rights. In 2008, on completion of his three year mandate, Professor Ruggi presented the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework. And in the following slides, we'll talk in detail about them. But this framework was seen as a conceptual way to anchor the debate around. Uh, anchor the debate around the responsibilities of responsibilities of corporates as well. Um, but you know, also what happened in 2008 that when Professor Ruggi presented the when Professor Ruggi presented the Protect, Respect, and Remedy, uh, Remedy framework, the Human Rights Council welcomed uh, welcomed Ruggi's report and 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 extended his mandate until 2011 with the task of operationalizing and promoting the framework. So the idea was that, you know, once you do have this uh, framework, which I said, you know, which as I mentioned, we would talk about in detail, but he was tasked to provide concrete recommendations on how the state could prevent abuse by the private sector. Uh, he was also asked to elaborate on the scope of corporate responsibilities and to explore options for effective remedies to those impacted by corporate human rights abuse. Over the next three years, between 2008 and 2011, Professor Ruggi held extensive consultations um, around the world with a range of stakeholders, including government, civil society organizations, businesses, industry associations. And in 2011, he and in 2011 he presented the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, when you know when Professor Ruggi presented when Professor Ruggi presented the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, he stated that the Guiding Principles' normative contribution lies not in the creation of new international law obligations. So he did not ask for creation of new international law obligations at that time, but in elaborating on the implications of existing standards and practices for states and businesses integrating them with a single logically coherent and comprehensive template and identifying where the current regime falls short and how it could be improved. Uh, the guiding principles were unanimously endorsed by the, by the Human Rights Council uh, in 2011. In fact, this June 2021 would be, um, would be the 10th anniversary of business and human rights. And there has been all kinds of conversations about what's been the progress, um, you know, what has been the progress in the last decade, but how do we also inform the business and human rights discourse in the years to come? Uh, next slide, please. So what are these UN guiding principles? You know, the guiding principles, as I said, respect on the protect, respect, and remedy framework that was introduced by Professor John Ruggi. These are essentially a set of 31 principles that are directed at states and companies and clarify their duties, their responsibility to protect and respect human rights in the context of the business-related human rights, business uh, in the context of business activities and also ensure access to an effective remedy for individuals and groups affected by such activities. Now, a lot of time, you know, many businesses have sort of asked questions about what kind of businesses does it, you know, what kind of businesses does it cover? But the UNGPs applies to all the business irrespective of their size and respective of their size and scale, and also covers all human rights. It does not give preference or, you know, it doesn't give prioritization to one right um, over other. And that kind of uh, takes into the human rights principle, you know, takes takes the foundational, um, foundational principle of human rights that 
no right has a precedence over another right. Uh, so the guiding principles, as I said, are these 31, um, you know, 31 principles directed both at the states as well as the governments. Next slide, please. So what is this protect, respect, and remedy framework? So when Professor Ruggi, so the uh, the the protect, respect, and remedy framework essentially uh, rests on three pillars. The first pillar is protect, which is it highlights the state duty to protect, which says that the states have a states have a duty. You know, we are. It's, it's, this is also the moment to just you know uh, reflect on how states do have the duty, and then they remain the primary duty bearers to protect against human rights abuses against actors, including the businesses. How can states, um, how can states help in, um, or you know, how can states fulfill their duty to protect by developing policies, by adjudication, regulation, bringing in legislation on different issues, um, and we'll talk in detail about the national action plans, which is you know also one of the key, uh, which is also one of the key elements or one of the key ways for states to fulfilling its duty to protect um, protect against human rights abuses caused by businesses. The second pillar essentially talks about the responsibility of businesses. So this is the second pillar is the corporate responsibility to respect. It calls upon businesses to respect human rights and it provides the complementary role of complementary